Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Now that we've had time to think and reflect, what do we make of the Hindenburg Report's allegations against the Adani Group? And second, given that almost every single day for the last six days, Adani Enterprises' share price has been falling, including today as well, what should be a correct evaluation of the Adani Enterprise share? Those are two issues I shall raise today with one of the world's most renowned corporate finance and equity valuation experts, Professor of Finance at New York University's Stern School of Business, Ashwat Damodaran. Professor Damodaran's most recent blog has actually discussed the two issues I want to raise with him. Professor Damodaran, before I come to your personal evaluation of Adani Enterprise, let's start with your analysis of the Hindenburg Report. To begin with, you questioned the Hindenburg claim that Adani is the biggest con in history. You write, and I'll repeat this for the audience, a con game to me has no substance at its core and its only objective is to fool other people and part them from that money. In contrast to that definition of a con, you say Adani, notwithstanding all of its flaws, is a competent player in a business infrastructure, which, especially in India, is filled with frauds and incompetence. So would I be right in saying you don't believe this is the greatest con in history, and that is the first point at which you disagree with Hinder? No, it's, it's not so much disagreement. I've seen short-selling reports before. They're like old-time Bollywood movies. They're over the top. I mean, then it's so in a sense, hyperbole is part of the game. They need to get your attention. And guess what? Biggest con game in corporate history got people's attention. That worked for, for, for the Hindenburg Group. That doesn't mean it stands. Mm -hmm. I don't think con, the con game is the right fit here. I think there are lots of issues you can take up with the Adani Group. But I think the collective judgment that this is all a con game designed to make pe people poor is not the end game here. Okay, so that is a very clever title to catch attention, and it clearly worked. Right. But it's not really the biggest con game in history. Let's then come to what you believe are the three components that comprise the Hindenburg critique. They are serious contentions, circumstantial evidence, and questionable claims. And I'd like to briefly go through each of these one by one. The serious contentions are the Mauritius-based shell entities, which you say have no real operating purpose, but they do have links to the Adani Group companies. So do you accept the connection Hindenburg makes between these shell companies and the main companies? I, well, I took the, on that, I take them at their face value, because if they've lied about that, if they've made that up, the whole report comes apart. So from that perspective, I'm fairly sure that if you start digging, that there are 38 shell companies or perhaps more that the Adani Group has maintained outside India. The question is to what purpose? Nobody has a shell company in the Cayman Islands, the Mauritius, for operating purposes. This is an island with $11.5 billion in, in GDP. This is not exactly where you go to do business. You go, Indian companies have gone there to avoid taxes. But in this case, I think it was designed 
to preserve control. I, 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 to me, when I see the Adani group, there are two words that come to mind, ambition and control. And when ambition and control come together, you're going to take actions that's, that walk awfully close to the line between legal and illegal, acceptable and unacceptable. And that, I think that's what the Adani group is guilty of, of being ambitious and then putting control over every other objective in running the business. Just for lay audiences, what you're suggesting is that the shell companies are actually Adani's own money and it's being used to prop up his ownership of the declared listed companies. It's not even to prop up the ownership. It's even sillier than that. And this is why, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's almost tragic in its consequences. I really think that the objective was to skirt the 75% listing requirement rule. They were so obsessed with it that I think a great deal of what they did was to make sure that they met that rule by, by any means possible. So I think that that the, uh, the that the end game here was actually to stay listed on the, on, on the exchanges and to pass the requirements that you needed to do that. So that's my reading of it because you know if they were manipulating earnings they were doing an awfully bad job of doing it. I mean this is not you know I'm not an expert in this field, but would I be right in saying that the announcement by Morgan Stanley Capital International yesterday that certain Adani investors are no longer to be considered free float. And then the announcement made today by Morgan Stanley that they will be reducing the weightage in their index by something close to 30%. That corroborates your concerns and fears. Yeah. Because you fall out of the indices, then BlackRock and Vanguard and all those other investors hold it passively. I mean, BlackRock and Vanguard did not seek the Adani group out, but once they became a large market cap company, in a market that's now growing and becoming a greater part of the global index, you are going to become part of index funds around the world. So once you're removed from those indices, all those shares disappear because those people will not hold your shares again. So the Adani group, it was about not just being listed and issuing shares, about being listed, getting a large market cap and getting this international holding of you. And I think there's an extension. I mean, uh, let's face it, the bulk of the capital for the Adani group has come from lenders. It's come from banks, it's come from bondholders, not from equity investors. And those people also, I, and I think it's a mistake to do this, lend based on reputation, lend based on market cap, even though it might not be directly backed up by market cap. So there's a danger here. You could get into a spiral where your equity price drops, you get delisted, the bondholders start pulling back. And that is the spiral that the Adani Group has to try to avoid if it wants to survive and come out of this at least reasonably intact. Absolutely. And this reduction of weightage in the Morgan Stanley Capital International Index will put further pressure, I presume, on the Adani share price. Now let's come to the circumstantial evidence. You say this comprises the stock price manipulation charges, but here, if I've read your blog correctly, you're not convinced either of the manipulation or perhaps of how effectively it was done. Because you're right, to be able to manipulate and move the market capitalization of a company by 100 billion, roughly the increase in 2022, you would expect to see huge numbers of shares being traded by these entities, and I don't see that. So let me ask, how serious are your doubts? And secondly, how damaging are they to the Hindenburg critique? Now, I, I, I don't li think it lies at the heart of the Hindenburg critique because I think their point is more for the lenders than for the equity investors. Their point, I think, is the Adani Group has made itself look financially healthier than it is and as a consequence has been able to borrow more money at better rates than it should have. I think the price manipulation part is more the consequence of seeing a stock price double during the course of a year, having the circumstantial evidence of there are 38 shell companies connecting the two and say, it must be the fact that you've had these shell companies that, can, that have shares inside them that's going to allow you to push the price up. But I've watched markets for 40 years. For prices to move up, it's not who holds the shares that matters, who trades the shares. Because if you hold shares and you don't trade, you don't have an effect on price. 
So I was looking for some evidence from Hindenburg on a surge in trading volume on strange days where, I mean, the, the float is light on the stock. So it's true you can move the stock a fair amount with relatively little trading. But to increase 100 billion, you'd need to see more evidence of significant trading. And I, I don't see that. I don't see that, at least in the report. I don't see that. I scanned through the trading volume through the course of the last year. I don't see sudden surges in volume. So if you ask me why did the price double, I think it was more the consequence of lazy foreign investors deciding that they want to make a bet on the India story. And a big part of the India story is infrastructure needs to be built. And for them, the Adani group seemed like, hey, let's go there. It looks like an easy way for us to ride that story off into the sunset. And like all foreign investor lazy stories, lazy stories come to a bad, bad end. But you're saying something very interesting and important. The doubling of the share value last year was not necessarily or even manipulation by Adani. It was lazy foreign investors betting on the India story mm -hmm. without perhaps doing their homework properly. Exactly. They are to blame rather than Adani. And are you surprised by it? Have foreign institutional investors ever invested in India? Some of them might. Most of them invest on the surface. They invest based on, they call, I mean, they talk to somebody in Mumbai and say, what are five good Indian companies I should put my money in? And in a, in a sense, they call this active investing, but there's no degree of deep research that backed into them going into any of these companies. So I wasn't surprised that they were lazy and made this bet. But I do think it's a big part of the story. And it, in a sense, as foreign investors wring their hands and complain about uh, about the fraud, they are, I mean, they should be pointing the finger back at themselves saying, where was your due diligence? Why weren't you asking the right questions? I'll be quite honest, everything in the Hindenburg report, I was able to see in Indian press reports at different points in the five years leading into the Hindenburg report. Absolutely. I I, can I, I'll pick up on that point in a moment's time, but there's one more thing I'd like to touch on first. You seem to me, if I've read your blog correctly, to have your most serious doubts or questions about what you call questionable claims. You write, the questionable claims are the ones to do with earnings manipulation. And then you add, if Adani is manipulating earnings, it is not doing a very good job reporting low margins and return. It seems this is one charge in the Hindenburg report you really don't believe at all. Yeah, because if, if you're going to manipulate earnings, wouldn't you report high earnings margins that are superior? I mean, not, none of the Adani companies are earnings machines. They have, they have lots of revenue. So maybe if, if your story is about, hey, they're overbooking revenues, I'm willing to listen. But earnings manipulation, I, I mean, this is terrible. It's a terribly done job of earnings manipulation because their margins at 3.6%. They're actually lower than the typical global infrastructure companies. So it is, is it possible that they're still playing games with earnings? I guess so. But the evidence doesn't seem to suggest that that was the end game, that that was what they were trying to do. This is fascinating. I'll simply point out for the lay audience that not only have you raised several questions or doubts about the Hindenburg critique, but you've also very interestingly said that a fairly substantial part of the blame, if that's the right word, for the way the price doubled last year is actually lazy foreign investors rather than manipulation done by Adani but, but, about his own companies. But, that's a particularly I, important point. Can I add something to that? Indian markets, for as long as I've watched them, have been dominated by momentum investors, bullish momentum investors. Indian markets celebrate bullish momentum investors. They crown people as the Indian bull and then the plaudits follow. Fundamentals have never been a big driver in Indian markets. There is a collective sense of if there's a bandwagon, we're going to jump on. And I think that's part of the reason there was no pushback against the foreign institutional investors. You're saying, where were the Indian investors with doubts coming in and selling into this momentum? And the reason is nobody what wants to get in the path of bullish momentum in Indian markets. There's an asymmetry in Indian markets. Bulls are celebrated bears are denigrated. If you say anything bearish about the market, you can say it about individual companies. It's almost like nobody wants to hear you. 
So I think there's a collection of forces here <clears throat> coming into play where blame can be spread across <clears throat> across lots of people, you know, around the, in the ecosystem. Absolutely. And you're making another very important point, which I hope the audience hears, that we celebrate bulls. We don't give as much respect to bears. And sometimes we should be listening to bears because they may have understood and spotted something which the bulls are either deliberately blind to or at least not willing to see. Now, one more point about the Hindenburg claim, and that is the claim that Adani is over levered. And you say being over levered is not a con game, but a risk. And in fact, you point out that infrastructure business is full of companies that borrow heavily. And you add, I'm not sure that many of them will withstand the Hindenburg test for over leverage. So here you're saying, if I've understood you correctly, that Adani is really no different to many other infrastructure companies. They tend as a business to be over leveraged. And here, let's let, let's not leave the bankers out of the equation. I've always wondered why banks like to lend to real estate developers. And the bigger and more garish your real estate, the more they will lend to you. So it's this combination of infrastructure companies liking to borrow and banks liking large physical assets to lend against. It's like a marriage made in heaven. The marriage doesn't end well, but it's a marriage made in heaven. And I, you know, I... I would not borrow as much. I'll be quite honest. That's why I said it's a risk that I, I think is worth debating whether we should borrow less as infrastructure companies. But on that, I think it's a business argument you're making it against Adani. This is not good management practice. It's not good business practice. I'm not investing in you. And if you're a lender, you should be charging a higher interest rate. That's a legitimate question to ask. But that's not a con game. That's just over borrowing, and I'm sure most real estate developers in India would have worse financial metrics on leverage than the Adani Group does. And this is another very important over leverage is not a con game, it is a risk. It may be bad business management of your company, but that's a different thing. And again, this is something that investors who do their diligence should be able to spot and find out. It's not something that's hidden from them. But you know what? The Adani Group made life really easy uh, for Hindenburg, right? It, the, the way I describe them is they're like a ma they're like a man wearing a trench coat in a city looking for people who are flashing. You know, it's uh, you basically draw attention to yourself because you created the uh, you're, you're an opaque company. It's difficult to figure out what's going on in, inside you. People see from the outside that you know. So when people make you know, make these these claims against you, it becomes very difficult to defend because you spent your entire lifetime hiding in the darkness. And nobody can come out and say, no, no, that's not what they do because they really don't know what you do. It's the downside of the complexity and the opacity that some family groups, not all family groups in India, have made part of their 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 setup. And I think that makes it more difficult to defend them and for them to defend themselves when something like this comes up. Let me at this point come to the point you were making earlier and I stopped you because I think people will fully understand that point now at this more juncture. You say there are plenty of Indians who have been saying and thinking what is made explicit in the Hindenburg report for quite a while. So what really is at stake here is not that Hindenburg has said something new. The real question is, why were these Indian critics who've been saying similar things for quite a long <clears> while <throat> not been given bigger platforms to air their views? I mean, in other words, the Hindenburg message was available to everyone in India, but no one was listening. I don't know. I, I mean, I... I, I, I... maybe they were given the platforms and everybody put their hands on their ears and were unwilling to listen. Maybe investors don't want to hear bad news. I'm reminded of one of my favorite mu movies. It's uh, called A Few Good Men, Jack Nicholson. And the movie ends with him on the dock saying, you can't handle the truth. I mean, it's a, he's, he's on, on the dock being accused of something. He said, tell me the truth. And he says, you can't handle the truth. And in many ways, I think investors, business people don't want to handle the truth about the seams in the India story, the weaknesses. They don't want to seem to deal with it frontally. And as a consequence, when, when you get an example like this, they prefer to push it into the backwaters because if you look at it too carefully, 
you can't stop there, right? You got to look at other companies with those features. And I'm not sure that anybody wants that scrutiny, to be quite honest. You know, the financial press doesn't want it. The markets don't want it. The businesses don't want it. There was a collective willingness to not ask tough questions. So I don't know the answer to why those people or those reports, because I distinctly read at least five or six reports that were detailed in their critique, almost like the Hindenburg report in terms of what they were saying. But they were, and, and there, there's one possible answer. Adani is a political company. And when you have a company that's connected politically, critics are viewed as either, they're not cr criticizing the business, they're criticizing a political party. So somewhere along the way, I think that became part of the process as well, is every criticism of Adani was viewed as, hey, that's really not criticizing the company, you must be disagreeing with the government, and that's why you're critiquing the company. In a strange way, by connecting themselves at the hip to, to politics, they made almost all the criticisms, especially when it came from Indians. And that might be why a foreign critique was accepted, was any Indian already was, who did you vote for in the last election? Now tell me what you think about the Adani group. And then it became, it's in, it's in statistics, it's called Bayesian statistics, that your preconceptions are driving you to it. So I think it's, um, it's an indictment of all of us, not just in India. It's happening in the U.S. with Tesla and Elon Musk or Twitter and Elon Musk, because I think it's part of life. Politics seems to have permeated business and investing. Welcome to the apocalypse. Absolutely. As you're saying, because of his political connections, Adani was too powerful for Indians to criticize. But the claim that some Indians make that Hindenburg has opened their eyes for the first time is simply not true. Their eyes were open. The criticism was available. They just didn't want to hear it or they didn't want to respond to it. And that's, that's an important message you're giving the Indian people. I, w I, I don't mean it's a message. It's an observation. I, it, I really don't understand it. How can something be in the public domain for so long and not be more part of the conversation. I'm not saying you need to knock down the Adani stock price, but why wasn't it more of the conversation? The leverage, I think, has been a little bit more talked about, about that they have debt. But other than that, the other issues seem to just sink into the quicksand and never come back up again. My last question about the Hindenburg report, and I think, as I read your blog, that this, in a sense, is a summing up of your view, maybe even a conclusion of your view of the Hindenburg report. You write, I must confess that I find the Hindenburg shock and awe approach of throwing up dozens, perhaps hundreds of accusations of wrongdoings at a firm, hoping that something sticks off-putting. Since even if I am in agreement, I find myself spending time trying to separate the wheat from the chaff, the big wrongdoings from the minor distractions. In other words, Hindenburg fails to distinguish between what's important and maybe even possibly critical and what's unimportant and maybe possibly irrelevant. And to me, that suggests a lack of judgment and discernment on Hindenburg's part. You have to remember their end game is not to come to a productive conclusion. It's to create chaos. It's to create chaos. I mean, that's what short sellers do. They create enough chaos in markets that buyers pull back. From their perspective, creating chaos is the end game. From my perspective, it's about asking questions of in about what does this mean for the long term for a business? So I think that they accomplished their they they've accomplished their objective of creating chaos. We're in a position now where we have no idea what the truth is and what's false. But I, you know, I don't th it's not that's why you can't read the Hindenburg report as like a legal indictment. Some people are, right? They're li looking at What's the start? What's the middle? What's the what's the end game here? That's not what the Hindenburg report is designed to do. It's designed to create enough doubt in the air about the company. And the company has helped them on that, that there's chaos in markets. And if there's chaos in markets that you benefit from it as a short seller. Short seller is not a, you know, making a political indictment. They want to make money on this. They want to make money by the selling short on the bonds and selling short on the stock. So from that, that perspective, I can see what they're doing. But for me, if I'm looking at this as a description of what a company is doing, it's not a good company description, not meant to be a historical description or even an indictment. It's just a collection of accusations. At this point, 
a thought going through the mind of the audience will be the following, and let me put it to you. Yes. Some people will say, Professor Damodra is an expert in the field of corporate finance and equity valuation, and his critique of the Hindenburg report is tantamount to support of Adani. Would that be a mistaken impression? Because your criticism is suggesting that maybe some of the points Hindenburg makes are not quite fully established and others are perhaps even wrong, like the claim about earnings manipulation. No, I, uh, people don't believe me when I say this. I have absolutely nothing invested emotionally, financially, politically in this story. Until last week, the Adani group just, you know, I talked about it once in a while. It never even entered into my realm of consciousness because I was not that interested in the story. I'm not that interested in. So, to, you know, when 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 people read my 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 post and they said, "Are you, uh, you know, supporting the Adani's?" I said, you know, "My sensation is like a pox on both houses. I don't really care about the Hindenburgs. I don't care about the Adani group." I'm not trying to split the middle either. I just want to say, you know, I, I want to get a sense of what does the truth look like on the other side? I really want to come through this mess because we're in this toxic phase where there are going to be accusations thrown. It's part of politics. But once we come out on the other side, what does this mean? Not just for the Adani group, but for Indian businesses, Indian companies, Indian investors, I'm much more concerned about that than about what the Adani group does or what Hindenburg group does, because I really don't care about either side in this argument. Absolutely. As you say, you were looking to find the truth. And now I'm going to come to an issue where the truth established by you is not going to be necessarily pleasing to the Adanis at all. I'm coming to your personal evaluation of Adani Enterprise Limited. You write, and I'm quoting you, a valuation of Adani Enterprises with upbeat assumptions on revenue growth and operating margins, and without factoring any of the Hindenburg accusations of fraud and malfeasance, yields a value of just about 945 rupees per share. So even today, when the price is 40% below the level of January 24th, when Hindenburg first came out, and the share price this evening when the Bombay stock market closed was 1853 rupees, you still believe the company is priced too high. So can I ask you briefly, how did you arrive at that valuation of 945 rupees per Adani enterprise share? When I think about valuation, I think about valuing a business. I mean, valuing a business, you look at its capacity to grow, its capacity to make profits, its capacity to need to reinvest to get that growth. And infrastructure businesses are notorious for three things. One is the margins are low. You know, even a well-run infrastructure company, your margins are low because often you're quasi-utilities. I give the example of Mumbai Airport and Adani Group, and, you know, Adani Group Investment. It's not like you can double prices to airlines to fly into gates because it's a quasi utility. They're going to go to the government and say, we need to fly into Mumbai airport. You know, the group is. So in a sense, infrastructure companies end up with margins of six, seven, eight percent. That's a good infrastructure company. So one way to think about the Adani group is say, let's suppose that they're and you value them as a bunch of infrastructure companies, which is what they are. Other than Adani food, everything else is no long gestation periods, capital intensive. So I gave them the characteristics of a good infrastructure. In fact, I put them in the top, probably in the top quartile of infrastructure companies globally. And I said, if they can generate the earnings of a company like that, they're not doing it right now. And they continue to grow. Why? Because they're India based. There is infrastructure investment coming. Then the value I see, 945 is false precision. I, you know, you come up with a number, but think of it around 1,000 rupees. 1,000 rupees is about, 1.6 times book value. Typical infrastructure companies, you know, if you think about book value, it's all physical assets, there's value to it. Traded about one and a half times book value, 1.3 times book value. I'm actually giving them a premium on a typical infrastructure company. They were trading at eight times book value, 300 times earnings at the start of 2023. No infrastructure company I've ever seen has traded at that kind of rich pricing. It was trading like a, a software company with all of its... It was trading like a Zomato on steroids. 
You know, you, you, it, and it didn't make sense to me. And from my perspective in valuation, I know markets make judgments, they make mistakes, they make the pricing judgment. My job is to step back and say, okay, what would I pay for the company? And let me be very clear, my valuation was not to tell other people to sell. I value companies for an audience of one, which is me. The question I was asking is, would I buy Adani? Because I was interested. The stock has dropped at 60%. Maybe it's become interesting. And my reaction after I looked at the value was, you know, there's, there's, it's got a little more, you know, it's got, it's got a way to go before I say, okay, it's a company I will add to my portfolio. So my valuation, maybe I'm missing something about the Adani Group's infrastructure investments, but from what I know about infrastructure companies around the world, a thousand rupees, maybe if you're optimistic, 1200 rupees would be the limits to which I'd go. But that's me. But you know, I'm reading what you actually said. You said that price of 945 per share was without factoring any of the Hindenburg accusations of fraud and malfeasance. So now, if you factor those in, will the price fall below 945? Yeah. I presume it will. Well, if you if, if they're right about the earnings manipulation, which they're not, let's say that, let's say these companies are actually losing money, not making money. We don't know yet, right? If, if that works out. Then we have a serious problem on our hands. Not only do you have to have a, a worse starting point for your valuation, you also have this debt burden hanging over your head. When you value a company, one of the questions you always have to ask is, what is the chance my company will not make it? With airlines, for instance, it's always a deadly drag on value because almost every airline, there's this threat of you won't make it through the next downturn hanging over its head. If there's manipulation going on, then you open the door to distress and failure, in which case it's truncation risk. The, your, your game is over. I attach, what, a 10% chance of failure to the Adani group, I think. And that came purely from looking at their existing debt load and their existing financials. But if the existing financials are shaky, they're being manipulated, then that 10% could very quickly become 20, 30, 40%. I put my spreadsheet out as a do it yourself. So people disagree with me. I said, don't don't argue with me about what I've got wrong. Just change it. Make it yours. So if any of you have, you know, you buy into the Hindenburg report, no, don't come to me and say you're wrong. Just go in and change that 10% to 30%. Change your earnings from what you think what it is right now to what you think it should be. And you're going to see the numbers drop to 600 rupees, 500 rupees. There is no floor until you get to zero. Absolutely. But, you know, since that blog came out, yeah. two events have happened. And obviously, you couldn't have factored them in. First of all, the Adanis have announced that they will pay back up to 1.7 billion of debt. And secondly, according to Reuters, but the Adanis themselves haven't said it, only Reuters has said it, that they are considering an independent assessment of the Hindenburg allegations. Would that those two events affect your valuation? Well, I mean, I, I, it's good to remove the doubt. My valuation, though, is independent of the Hindenburg report. So the second part, I think, is not the issue. The first part is interesting because it means that, and this is something I think the Adani group woke up to before the Hindenburg report came out, which is if you look at their behavior in 2021 and 2022, for the first time in their life, they actually used equity to fund some of their investments. Came 20% from equity, 80% from debt. Still disproportionately debt, but be because in the prior periods, it was close to 100% debt. So I think that they were, they've been aware for at least a couple of years that their debt is getting a little, is dangerously high. They need to bring it down. It, uh, I did see also reports that they were thinking about slowing down their capex and some of their entry into infrastructure investments. I think collectively, the scenario I see emerging from this, assuming that none of the issues of fraud and malfeasance and law breaking get to the point where it completely stops the company, you're going to get a less ambitious company coming out of this, a company that's not going to take as many projects each year, not jumping into new businesses as quickly, funded more with equity. You're going to finally see the, the family say, hey, you still control the company with 72% of the shares. You can go to 66%. You can go to 55%. There are family groups in India where the family controls the company with 20% of the shares. 
I think they need to let, they, I think you're going to see less of a fixation in keeping their shareholding completely within the family. So that's my guess is you're going to get, see a lower growth company that perhaps is going to try to bring its debt load down. The debt load coming down is good news in my valuation from the failure rate perspective. But that also means that the growth that I'm putting in now has to be scaled down as well. I mean, nothing in a story is ever left intact when something else in the story changes. That's the essence of valuation. So the story I might need to tell if this unfolds is of a lower growth company with less debt and less failure risk. Will it have a value greater than 950? Perhaps. But the key number here is the margin. As long as the margin stay at 6, 7, 8 percent, it's tough to get to 2000 rupees per share. But isn't the actual earnings hovering around 3% of, of revenues, the, the, both on uh, the margins and returns? So basically, I am assuming that one uh, and, and but their infrastructure investments are also relatively young. So when you look at a typical infrastructure company, it's got a lot of mature infrastructure investments in which they've been around in 15, 20 years. Infrastructure investments tend to get more profitable as they age strange phenomenon but basically it means that you're not putting in as much capital investment in an airport that you've had for 20 years as an airport that you've just built so over time margins tend to drift up and in this case that's the phenomenon i'm drawing on to assume that margins over time will go from the 3.6 percent there right now to seven percent i'm doubling of margins but that's also reflective of the fact that the adani is a young infrastructure group in terms of the investments they've made one quick question. If your forecast that this will be a less ambitious company becomes true, will it also be a more reassuring company? I think so. I mean, I think that's why I said this. My, if, 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 because I've heard from the other side as well that I'm out against the Adanis, that I'm trying to bring them down. Why would I want to? I fly Absolutely. into India all the time. I want an airport that actually works. I mean, I spent... One last yeah. One last issue, and you hinted at it in one of your answers earlier, but it's there in your blog up front. You say, and it's the connection you're making between the Adani meltdown and other Indian companies. You write, the ingredients that led to the Adani stock price meltdown are embedded in many Indian companies and represent the weakest links in the India story. Are there, are there other Adanis waiting to happen? Maybe my post will trigger Indian analysts and Indian investors to ask that question. I mean, I, I'm a dabbler. I've dabbled in Adani. I'm going to move on. It's going to be something else, some other issue, because that's what I do. I mean, I, I tend not, I mean, I don't do research. I don't dig deep. But, uh, you know, the, the questions you need to ask are simple. The analysis you have to do is straightforward. This is something that anybody can do on any family group company or any Indian company. I hope I've provided at least the template for people to be able to do that. And I, th I hope that because I think it will make Indian companies stronger to be tested. Because I think when you don't get asked questions, you overreach. And as we know, through the history of time, ambitious amb ambitions and overreach go together. And then you end up in the mess that the Adani group is in. If somebody had asked these questions four years ago, maybe the Adani group would not be fake. I mean, maybe they'd be a much healthier company. Maybe they'd use less debt. Maybe they wouldn't have those shell companies kind of distracting them from their core business. So I hope I've given people the template to kind of ask this question, but I, you know, I'm not going to go around doing this on Indian companies because frankly, my, my, my attention span is 15 minutes and I've used it up on the Adani group and I'm, you know, a bigger fish to fry or a different fish to fry. Absolutely. You bring an international perspective. You're looking at India from the outside, from New York, in fact. Has this done a lot of damage to India's standing as an investment destination in the eyes of international investors? Can I tell you something? In institu foreign institutional investors, if the attention span of fleas, <laughs> no, they, the amnesia they have for what has happened, forget five years ago, six months ago. I mean, these are investors who keep rushing back to Argentina every five years saying this time will be different. And Argentina is a country which has defaulted four times in the last 20 years. So if you're worried about long-term damage, that's not that shouldn't be a key worry. 
India should be what I mean, India should be self-assured enough at this point. Indians should be to not worry about what foreign institutional investors think about them. If you build world class companies and you are the fifth largest economy in the world already and you're climbing, they have no choice but to come to India. So for the moment, they might they might show signs of fleeing, but greed will win out over that every single time. In which case, how do you respond to the manner in which SEBI and the government have responded to this crisis? Do you think their response has been the right one? They've underplayed it. They haven't gone very public, but SEBI is carrying out an inquiry or so they've let people know. And the government has simply said that they are confident regulation works, nothing more. How do you respond to that? Isn't that the rule book that every government and every regulator follows in a crisis? I mean, it, it's it, it's not just Indian, right? I mean, I think about 2008 in the U.S. and what the U.S. government and the SEC said at that time. It's a template of regulators. What I'm, I'd be looking for is action. Now, so if they underplay it in words, I don't mind. But I want them to at least start the process of changing the inertia and indifference that I think lies at the heart of all regulation in India. I mean, I might be wrong about this, but the classic response of a bureaucrat in India is it's best not to make a decision. It's best to move things along to somebody else. And I think that may explain why there's been so little action on the Adani groups, you know, flirting with these rules over the period. And that needs, you know, it's not just a new rule. My fear is that they'll create a new rule. In fact, that's the nature of, of regulating. Let's write some new. It has to be a change in culture about risk taking and about letting people make, in this case, rule makers make decisions and backing them up rather than leaving them out to dry. So that cultural change is, is what I hope I see at least the start of after this. But I'll be quite honest, I'm not that optimistic that cultural changes come quickly. It, it takes a while. Absolutely. My last question, the Supreme Court today has publicly proposed that the government should, have, should set up a committee of experts, including perhaps a judge. I imagine that's a sitting judge they have in mind. And this has been offered by the Supreme Court as a suggestion to the government that the Supreme Court has asked the government to come back by Monday with its response. Does this look like the right sort of action? I don't trust experts. No, I'll be quite honest. I mean, I, no, I, I think experts are, you know, we can get a group of experts together in a room. They will go on the one hand, on the other hand, and three years later, there'll be a report that nobody reads. I think that the actions have to be much more pragmatic. They've got to come in the form of, you know, business leaders announcing within, I would love to see a few family group companies come out and say, look, this mess came out of the opacity that we've created around companies. We're going to try to create more transparency. Jump in front of the regulation. Don't wait for experts to tell you what we all know what needs to happen. This is not we it's not this is not one of those problems where we don't know what the solution is. We know what the solution is, but we also know that getting to that solution is going to be painful. Family groups have to give up control. Investors have to accept the fact that if they take risks, sometimes they're going to lose money. That hearing pessimistic stories about companies is not the end of the game. It's part of the game. So, uh, you know, I think that there will be a committee. It's, it's in whenever you have something like this, something like that comes out of it. I'm not hopeful that the committee is going to be the turning point in this in this crisis. It's got to come from individuals deciding that that. No, we, we need change and the change has to start from within whatever they control. So that's what I hope to see is I hope to see companies, investors, uh, analysts, please start to ask the right questions about what should we do next so that we don't we, that we don't become the next Hindenburg target. No. But the important thing, Professor Damodran, is that you're saying that the time has come for a fairly comprehensive change of culture from family owners of companies to analysts to investors across the board. That change of culture is essential, but the good news is you do not believe that there is long-term damage that's been done to India as an investment destination. As you so beautifully put it, greed will trump 
And just as they kept returning to Argentina, despite four defaults, they will keep investing in India because they will forget fairly quickly the crisis they've lived through. That's absolutely right. Thank you very much indeed for this interview. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.